Hello everyone, today I'm going to take you to see how the American aircraft carrier became king of the sea. Before watching this video, don't forget to leave your comment below if you have any suggestions or certain topics to discuss for the next videos. In just a century, aircraft carriers have evolved from launching canvas-winged biplanes to formidable fighter jets capable of striking targets from hundreds of miles away. Although the ships themselves have changed a lot in the past 100 years, aircraft carriers remain the answer to one of the toughest questions for any navy, how do you project power by sea? In 1942, Admiral William Bull Halsey, one of America's greatest aircraft carrier commanders, briefly summed up the role of the carrier in enabling the U.S. Navy to approach each other with everything you have as quickly as possible and hand it over to him. The U.S. was not the thinker behind the first aircraft carriers. Developed during the early 20th century, aircraft carriers or seaplane tenders were deployed across the Atlantic during World War I. Like tank development, the U.S. Navy initially followed in the footsteps of Britain and other European nations. The U.S. Navy's first aircraft carrier, USS Mississippi, was converted from a warship in 1913. The new Mississippi seaplane saw action during the American occupation of Veracruz, Mexico, launching a reconnaissance mission. Instead of launching the planes from its deck, Mississippi lowered the planes into the water and collected them after they landed. Although it had the advantage of the moment, it also prevented planes from flying when the seas were rough. The first big steps towards modern aircraft carriers came when ships began launching aircraft from their decks rather than from the sea. December 7, 1941, the day that aircraft carriers proved their worth. The Imperial Japanese Navy launched a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor with more than 400 aircraft attacking from six carriers. Four American battleships were sunk, four more damaged, and over 2,000 people were killed. The U.S. Navy's three Pacific carriers, Enterprise, Lexington, and Saratoga, were all at sea during the attack. In retaliation, the U.S. executed one of the most ambitious missions ever launched from an aircraft carrier. Led by the U.S. Army Air Force, the Doolittle Raid launched on April 18, 1942, saw 16 B-25 medium bombers launch an audacious bombing raid against Tokyo, Nagoya, Kobe, and Osaka on the Japanese mainland, all launched from the U.S. carrier USS Hornet. After the mission, General James Doolittle explained the aims of his raid. It was hoped that the damage done would be both material and psychological. Material damage was to be the destruction of specific targets. The psychological results, it was hoped, would be the recalling of combat equipment from other theaters for home defense, the development of a fear complex in Japan. The continuing war in the Pacific saw a series of clashes between the fleet carriers of the rival navies. One of the first major carrier battles took place in June 1942 at the Battle of Midway, where aircraft from three American carriers engaged four Japanese carriers. The two-day battle saw the sinking of four Japanese carriers and a heavy cruiser. In June 1944, at the Battle of the Philippine Sea, the single largest carrier battle in history, the U.S.'s Fifth Fleet decimated the Japanese First Mobile Fleet sinking three Japanese fleet carriers and destroying over 500 enemy aircraft. The battle severely limited Japan's ability to fight at sea. Japan lost four carriers and the Yamato-class Masashi, the largest and most powerful battleship ever launched. She was sunk by torpedoes and bombs from planes launched from four U.S. carriers. But due to their huge size, carriers remained vulnerable targets for kamikazes throughout the war. In the last months of the war, the dominance of carrier-borne air power over the traditional surface battleship was decisively proven for the last time. The Japanese battleship Yamato, the Mashashi's sister ship, was attacked by torpedo and dive bombers from American carriers. Japan's last mighty battleship was quickly overwhelmed, and during the two-hour battle, 11 torpedoes and 6 bombs struck the ship before rolling over and exploding. With Japan's fleet decimated, soon the war would be over. The U.S. aircraft carrier had won the day. 
After proving their worth during the war, the U.S. Navy continued to develop its carrier force with vessels growing ever larger, more powerful, and able to carry modern jet aircraft. Nuclear power revolutionized carrier design, allowing even bigger ships to be built that could carry more aircraft, fuel, and weapons, and the carrier's endurance was only limited by its crew, no longer needing to refuel at ports or by support ships. Learning lessons from the first generation of supercarriers, the Navy perfected its next class of carriers. A former carrier captain, Rear Admiral Yank Rutherford, succinctly describes the vast city-like scale of the Nimitz-class carriers. The Navy's modern 95,000-ton displacement aircraft carrier includes about 75 aircraft, a 4.5-acre airfield, catapults, and a resting gear to launch and recover aircraft large magazines and storage facilities for ammunition, fuel, and aircraft parts, as well as high-tech maintenance activities that provide all the service and supplies necessary to keep well-maintained aircraft ready for mission assignment. For the crew, the carrier provides galleys, berthing areas, laundry services, medical, surgical, and dental facilities, and myriad activities necessary to ensure the health and well-being of the assigned personnel. Like a city, the ship has a fire and emergency response capability and its own security organization, including security forces, legal services, brig, and a process by which the captain enforces good order and discipline. With more efficient nuclear reactors, the Nimitz could carry more fuel, ammunition, food, and aircraft and could stay at sea for longer. The 10 ships of the Nimitz class have a projected lifespan of 50 years, designed to be bigger and better than anything Soviet Russia could build. While the Cold War had seen carriers play an important role in proxy wars like Vietnam, their main job was to counter Russia by projecting superior American air power against the Soviet Navy and land targets within the Communist bloc. With the end of the Cold War in the 90s, the Navy's massive carriers found themselves patrolling the world's oceans without an enemy, but their ability to project power was needed more than ever. The carrier had come a long way since its humble ad hoc beginnings, evolving from a hastily erected wooden deck to a floating airfield worth tens of billions of dollars and manned by thousands of sailors and airmen. But no matter how much the technology changes, the carrier's mission remains the same project power anytime and anywhere. Thank you for watching Military TV and see you in the next videos.